And let's go, go ahead, let's all stand together. We're going to take our hymnals, turn to 761. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return. Let's all stand together this morning. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their hands. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Great singing. You may be seated. All righty. Well, I'm glad you're here today. And uh, here we are. It's Sunday morning, and it's time for us to gather together. I hope that the Word of God will be an encouragement to you. And and help you with whatever maybe you're going through. The Lord knows and is able to give you the grace that is needed. This uh, song that he just sang, the actual passage that was being sung there, is when Israel returned and took their harps off the willows because they were back in the land. And there's always a joy being around God's people. So I'm glad that you chose to come. I was just thinking, a very good question to ask Mr. Tim is this. Excuse me, Tim, do you have any pictures of the baby? <laughs> I heard somebody, I think it was uh, Young Eckers or something, said, do you have a picture? He says, oh, and boy, the phone came out and the pictures came. And so um, that is, in fact, I, I think I heard him say too, because it's so new fatherish. He says, and he smiled. <laughs> and they don't smile at that age, he said. And it's just, it, don't you remember that when you had your child and you'd bring him in somewhere like that? And, or somebody would stop you in the store and say something and, you know, it was your favorite subject to talk about. And those are exciting times. So uh, I guarantee you Tim's going to have the calling card on his phone. So if you want to see day-by-day -day growth, just ask him. <laughs> And uh, you'll, you'll enjoy that. Nancy and I had the privilege of being over there the other day, spent a little time with them, and um, it's a very joyous couple. And uh, Harmony is doing well, too, uh, recovering quickly from her C-section, and we're, we're thankful for that. And you know what it's like, moms, uh, those first few days and getting up then and feeding and learning your child. It's an uh, exciting time for the Rainmakers. All righty, so let's open up with a word. Did we pray? No, okay, let's open up with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for new life. New life in the new birth of salvation. And then, Lord, also thank you for uh, children. Uh, many of you mothers here, uh, many are mothers here, and you, you, you have children, and I see them running around and hugging uh, people that they know here, and uh, what a joy it is. Uh, for that. Now we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the grace that is needed. Now we also pray that today as we open up your scripture, uh, you say that your word gives comfort. And so we pray that you would give us comfort where comfort is needed. Give us a challenge where challenge is needed. Give us a rebuke where rebuke is needed so that we can grow in our Christ likeness. Father, help us to finish the year strongly. Help us to end up the year with um, a great joy and triumph in you. And then, Father, if you tarry and we go into the new year, may we have a wonderful uh, 2022 as well in, uh, with our families and, and life and work and all that will transpire next year as well. So, Father, thank you now. Bless and encourage us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I do think we have verses. So let me see here. We'll switch there. There we go. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, let's say it together. We'll start in Malachi. These are our, our verses for November. Together. Malachi 4.2 But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as a calf of the stall. 
Malachi 4.2. Then, of course, our next verse is Psalm 92.2. Uh, 92.12, ready? Let's say it together. Ready? Psalm 92.12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Psalm 92.12. Okay, Mr. Tim. We appreciate Ryan helping out today. Really appreciate that. Well, let's all stand together this morning. Take your hymnals to song number 336. There is a fountain filled with blood, referencing the blood of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that Jesus shed his blood to pay for our sin. Let's sing it out this morning. Song number 336. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all guilty sins and sinners plunge beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I though Wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wound supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die on the last. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Great singing. Five verses, but definitely awesome truth. And what a wonderful thing to sing about. Well, let's continue singing in the Wilds Hymnal, song number 142, When I Survey. We're going to sing all four verses. Uh, song 142 in the Wilds, When I Survey. 
When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor content on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Let's sing this one slowly. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Let's sing it out on the fourth. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Great singing, church. You may be seated. All right, a couple announcements. Um, those that are desiring membership at Faithway Baptist Church, several of you have um, uh, spoken to me um, ab about that. What we're going to do is on December 6th, uh, right here at 6 p.m. at night, if you have an interest in joining this church, uh, we are going to kind of lay out a little bit about Faithway Baptist Church. Uh, in fact, I have a sign-up sheet in the back that you are going to be there on uh, that date. Then I can send you some information via email to prepare you. And then any questions you might have about the church or what we stand for or what we believe or how we operate, we certainly want to be able to answer those questions. It's also going to be a time for you, as our deacons will be here, to listen uh, to your testimony about how you came to Christ. And then from there, that whole group, we hope on the following Sunday, uh, to bring you into membership of a Faithway Baptist Church. So if you said, you know, I've never mentioned it to you, but I do have that desire, then that's the day for you to come and learn more about Faithway Baptist Church. And so you can make an informed decision if this is where you feel the Lord would have you to serve and to use your talents in this local church. And so we would love for you to be there. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank you. It was an incredible week. Uh, I think we averaged over 50, maybe 53 people every night, and it was an in incredible. Matt was right on, right where we needed to be, challenged us. So many decisions were made among our own people. And then on Thursday, to see so many visitors here, uh, 11 or 12 from the fire department, some veterans, and what a joy it was to reach out to our community and sow the seed of the gospel as well as to honor them. Our mayor was here. How privileged we were to have our mayor come here and speak here and, and uh, uh, tell them that we're thankful for our community. And then on Friday, uh, we dipped down to about 21, but we played some games. So in fact, if first one up here with their license wins. Those of you who are here understand what that is. It was that he would say an item when we had a run up here. And let me tell you, there was some bumping, some pushing, and some shoving. And I was part of it. Because I like to win. 
<laughs> and so it was a, uh, it was a good time of uh, just laughter. There was just a lot of laughing and doing some silly things. You know, when you're 60, you're up here posing like a, uh, a weirdo. It's kind of embarrassing probably to Nancy a little bit. And then uh, the spaghetti dinner for the seniors is on. And I will give out some more details. We were trying to work with the seniors to find out how they felt about coming into our building. So we, we gave them the protocol of, of, of um, what would be taking place here so that they knew that you can't completely social distance here. Uh, vaccinations, we covered all of that with them so that they can make a, a, a choice if they want to attend or not. And so uh, we, we got those letters out to one group and, and then Jody, a lady that works with the seniors, is getting out to the second group. Um, I don't know how many we'll have. We'll, we'll see as the RSVPs come in. But I will be handing out a sheet for those of you that can come and help. We want to serve our seniors. And so I will get a list ready of um, how you can participate in helping. And then on November 23rd, which is just right around the corner, is our uh, Praise and Pies. So bring your favorite pie with you on the 23rd. That's a Tuesday instead of the Wednesday of Thanksgiving. Bring your favorite pie and we'll put them out on a table. And after we have a, a time of thanking the Lord and, and praising him for the year, maybe you want to share a testimony, uh, we'll, we'll devour the pies and uh, get off to a good start of calories before Thursday. We want to get a head start. I believe that an ungrateful heart is really the seeds of most of the sins we deal with. Just not being grateful for what God has given us. And so I hope that'll be the case. Remember when Matt was here and what a joy he was, is that God gifts the evangelist to come into a church to do what a pastor doesn't do. And that is to rally us once again and focus on the cross in a more intense way. And Matt did that. He was just an absolute joy to have Hannah and the kids. And he wrote a little thank you note that he wanted me to read to the church here. So I, I will read it on his behalf. And then I'll put it um, in the back there on the bulletin board. Uh, dear Faithway family, well, we certainly have been blessed and honored to say uh, the least to have been you th with you this past week. I am so thankful for your attentiveness to God's word and your response to what God has done in your hearts. I pray that the days ahead will be spiritually fruitful as you reach out and um, uh, watch God work. For you, for, uh, thank you for being welcoming to our family and thank you for giving so generously in our love offering. We look forward to seeing you uh, all in May because Matt you know, helps me in training, so he'll be here in May with the young men. May, when MBT training rolls around. Matt, Hannah, Sammy, and Campbell. So I'll, I'll post that on, on the backboard. I think I uh, covered everything, and so... Those of you who don't know, we do have a competitive pastor. So Friday was a lot of fun, and part of that fun was watching him uh, be very excited. And it was just a really exciting time anyway. But uh, let's all stand together for our final hymn. We are going to sing in the wild song number 149, Always the Same. We're going to begin with the chorus and sing the first and the second verse um, following that. Let's sing it out together. Always the same, oh, praise his name. Jesus never changes, he's always the same. Always together, his love is forever. Jesus never changes, he's always the same. I am his, he is mine, Jesus knows my name. I can rest in his arms, he's always the same. When I fall, when I call, Jesus takes my hand. Cleansing me, lifting me, he helps me to stand. Always the same, oh, praise his name. Jesus never changes, he's always the same. Always together, his love. 
love is forever. Jesus never changes. He's always the same. In his love I'm secure. We shall never part. In his word I will trust and give him all my heart. In the dark of the night, when my heart would fear, lovingly, tenderly, my Savior is near. Always the same, oh, praise his name. Jesus never changes, he's always the same, always to love is forever. Jesus never changes. He's always the same. Great singing. You may be seated. All righty. Those that um, are going back with Mr. Uh, Daniel, you can follow him uh, to the back and enjoy that time with him. I am very thankful we've had quite a few people step up to help out in different areas around the church here. Ryan, thank you. Oh my goodness. What a blessing that is to be able to know that we can train another person to help us out with our um, speaker, you know, our, our, our um, sound and so on. Thank you so much. And then also for um, Gavin has been going in the back to help with... Um, uh, junior Church, uh, well, I appreciate that as well. And then, of course, Amanda. Anytime you tell Amanda she can be in the nursery, she gets very, very excited. <laughs> and we are glad uh, for her service back there as well. And she has a real love uh, for children, and we're thankful for that. Uh, find your spot. Where is your giftedness? I know some of you. Some of you guys have Personality Plus and a great drive, and I know there's a place for you to fit in here. You just need to let us know. And uh, let's take that gift, that talent that God has given you, and let's use it on Sunday and Wednesday. Let's, let's use it to help others grow in their Christ-likeness. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that can take place here, and there are some that are in front of people that are needed as well. And so I hope that will be the case. Well, let's, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then I want to tell you a little story, and then uh, we'll launch into the text. Father, thank you now as we look at the scriptures, and we're so thankful for uh, the skillfulness that our evangelist uh, did with the scriptures, how careful he was to make sure that he preached uh, compassionately but very thoroughly. And thank you for that week. What a, what, what a great time that was to have him here. Thank you for him. We pray for him as he is preaching again this Sunday in another church and then uh, off to North Carolina. And we pray for safe journeys for that family and um, all the difficulties that they're facing with their home right now. So Father, thank you. Now bless and encourage us as we look into the scriptures. May we not look at revelation as something that's not relevant to us, but help us to glean the truth, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, I remember that uh, getting excited that uh, we, and when I was younger, I quite didn't understand time, and I remember that we were going to Florida for two weeks over Christmas. I was probably only about eight years old, and it just seemed like forever because uh, they probably mentioned it too early. Have you ever maybe kept something from your kids? Because if you tell them, they're like on you every minute. Are we going now? Like, hey, I'll take you to the park later. Now or, or tomorrow? And, you know, they just, they can't, they just want to get to the park. And I remember being so excited, and I remember that morning as we, we were leaving for school, I remember my mom saying to us, she says, now, when you get home, we're going to pack, and then we are getting on an airplane, and we are flying to Florida. Okay, that meant that the last event was to get through school. I just needed to get through school and let me tell you something I don't even know what was taught that day I'm sure I just want to get home because I had never been down there to Florida and I thought how exciting that's going to be to be down there while it's freezing cold here and we were going to be on the beach we were going to be in the hot weather and so for me that knowledge of that made me excited about what was going to take place I tell you that story because you can relate to that as being a kid or having a kid is that what we're going to learn today is an interlude. 
And the interlude is given because as soon as what is learned in chapter number 10, and then the seventh trumpet comes, there is no more interludes. It is going to move quickly through the book of time for those that are in the time of tribulation. So there's like there's this interlude. Now I want to relate that to this. Since we're not going to be in the tribulation, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to relate that to this interlude that we have right now that at the 69th week where Messiah, Jesus Christ, is reaching out to Jerusalem as the promised Messiah, and the leadership and the people reject Christ. So as Christ is coming in, he weeps over the city. You know that little short verse, Jesus wept. He's weeping over the city because he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how thou killest the prophets. And he said, how I wanted to gather you as a hen does her little chicks, put, put their wings around them to protect them. You have not. And that's called the cutting off of Messiah. That's when Israel rejected Christ. And God then in his providence and his care ushers in an interlude between the 69th week and the 70th week, the start of the tribulation, is, is this time period called the church. That's what we're in now. It's dispensational in the sense of time periods. So God has carved this area in from the time of Messiah being cut off until he returns in the clouds. Has he returned in the clouds yet? No, because we're still here. For those of us that know Jesus is our Savior, when he returns to the clouds, we'll be caught up. So as we look at chapter number 10, we see an interlude in the persecution. We're not in that because we're not going through the tribulation, but we can relate it to the time period we're in here as well, and I'll try to do that the best I can. So let's take our Bibles, and let's turn to chapter number 10 of Revelation. We are uh, getting about halfway through it. We're, 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 we're almost there to the halfway point, and we've learned a lot. Uh, the, a, a book in the Bible is great, but if it isn't relevant to us today, who cares? And so somehow we have to make sure that we're bridging this and, and, and relating it to where we are uh, today, where we live. So I'm going to read these 11 verses. There's not many here, and we'll, we'll go through chapter 10. Now remember, we've already set the stage. We've already seen the six trumpets. We've already covered those. But the seventh trumpet haven't sounded. So naturally, if you didn't know 10 was there, you were reading this letter, and you said, okay, there was the sixth trumpet, you would expect when you got back to the letter, oh, here's the seventh trumpet. But God decides in his providence, he decides to give us an interlude here, a, 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 a time period. And so let's, let's take a look at it. So that's where we're picking up. If you haven't been here in a while, that's where we are. Chapter number 10 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire and he had in his hands a little book now that word book can also mean scroll a little book a little scroll opened and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voice. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voice, I was about to write, and I heard a voice uh, from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders, the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hands to heaven. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein um, are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the seas, and the things which are therein, that they should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, should be finished, and and he hath declared to his servants the prophets. 
And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the seas and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it. That's kind of strange. Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, uh, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. What in the world is this all about? What, what is going on here? What, what is happening here? Now, like we have been studying, we're not trying to look at every leaf in the forest. We're trying to look at it from its big picture and relate it to where we live today. So Revelation 10, we see the suffering Savior who is exalted as a mighty angel holding the little book, or we could say a little scroll. So the picture here is a mighty angel, and, and, and he's holding a book. And the chapter is a chapter to refocus on the throne room because at times our focus, gets, our focus gets distracted from what we just had, um, as like we just had our meetings with our evangelists. The reason we had our meetings was because we need to get refocused. Uh, if you've worked at a company that uh, has a type of company where safety is a priority, sometimes you'll drive by and they'll actually post on their signs outside, uh, have not had an accident in so many days. They spend a lot of time training OSHA rules and making sure that everything is working because it is when you lose your focus that an accident happens. Same thing with us spiritually. When we get caught up with all the distractions and the circumstances of this life, sometimes we can forget that there's a God on the throne. There are times where we just can't understand what's going on and we lose focus. And whenever you lose focus, you always make a wrong decision. Did you over here hear? Maybe your parents taught you this or maybe someone else taught you this. It's always good to get a good night rest before you make that type of decision because if you respond right away, sometimes it's out of fear. It's out of whatever it might be. It might not be a good decision. So um, the Satan... All through human history, Satan has tried to make us humans believe the center of the world is us here on earth. That's all about us. And so at times, we need to refocus where the throne room is. That's where the center of everything is. That's where the control is. That's the one that we look to. So our text, again, will refocus our view to the one who is the center of all creation. He is the very center point. They used to have that commercial. I thought it was hilarious. You'll enjoy this. Is that, yes, you will. When uh, they had the little owl, because he's the wisest guy in the world, and they said, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? And he'd take it off, and that owl would go, one, two, three, <laughs> three. <laughs> because he could not hold back. And um, the center of the universe is not us. It is God. And if we don't spend time in the throne room, we will get confused. Life is difficult. Life sends turns and twists that seem to come out of nowhere. The text today will find an interlude uh, to get focused on verses 5 and 6, the Savior. What we're going to see in this book is two things, but one is just that who God is once again. And we'll see that in just a moment. That the Savior is in charge. Warren Wearsby, I don't know if you've read any books by him, but he has the B books, and they're very good. He said, remember Satan roars to frighten his prey, but the Lion of Judah roars to sound his victory. So when we're living down here and we hear the roar of circumstances, it's pretty ugly. It's all fear. It's all uncertainty. It's all, what are we going to do? Keeping us on the edge of fear. But when the, uh, when the lion of Judah, Christ, roars, you know what it says? It's going to be okay. 
it's going to be okay. I know you don't see that now. I know you don't understand why that happened. But God knows, and when we get to heaven one day, we'll say, thank you, God, that was a great decision. I could not see that through my circumstances. So whatever it is, that's where we will get one day. I love that comment by Warren Risby. I just love that. that the, the, the Lion of Judah roars and he sounds his victory. We must always remember that the events of the day will become overwhelming unless we live in the throne room daily. How do you do that? That is why Revelation is a book of comfort. It is also the last moment before the Antichrist is allowed to complete his conquest and force the whole world to submit to his control. So the point that we're at in the book of Revelation is simply this, is that once this interlude is over, it's a slippery slide. Have you ever climbed and climbed and climbed up the big slide and then you get to the top and then once you start, there's no stopping. You know, uh, one of those big, huge slides that they have. Once you decide to get on that roller coaster, it's all over. The next four minutes are totally upside down. And God does that here. There, 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 there's, there's a momentarily, there's an interlude here. And we're going to try to figure out why and how that applies to us today. So the two points are simply this. The angel and the scroll. The angel and the scroll. And the second point is the apostle and the scroll. So we got two main characters here, the angel and the apostle. So our first point today is the angel and the scroll. So there's an interlude in chapter 10 before the seventh trumpet. We know there's six trumpets, but we're waiting for the seventh. So we today are looking at this important mini vision between trumpet six and trumpet seven. The, the mini vision spends a great deal of time explaining on who this great and mighty angel is. Because this mighty angel seems to come out of nowhere and is speaking. And he has a book in his hand. That's very curious. And that book is open. In the first point, we want to look at this angel and gaze upon him in the fullness of John's description. In our text, we learn general descriptions, which gives us the identity of this mighty, mighty, mighty angel. Look at your text. Uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse number 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from the heavens, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as a pillar of fire. Many try to say that this angel is not Christ, but that it's only a Christological. In other words, it's only a representation or a type of Christ. This is the Lord Jesus, this mighty angel. And we can come to this conclusion by the description of the angel and compare those descriptions with the Old Testament appearance of Christ. So we can take a look at how he's described and some of his attributes. And because of the way he's described and because of some of his attributes, it has to be Christ. Let me lay a couple of those reasons out for you. Uh, we learned a few weeks ago in our study in the book of Joshua that at times in the Old Testament there were uh, Christophanies where Christ came as an angel, and, and, but it was Christ in the flesh, a precarnate Christ. We learned that a couple Wednesdays ago. The description of our mighty angel describes only what deity could perform. And an example would be Revelation chapter 1 where the description found there clearly mirrors Christ. So when you get a chance, go back and look at Revelation chapter 1, and then as you read that, you will see how Christ is described in 1 is also how he is described here in 10. And an example, uh, the word angel means messenger, and several times Christ is prophesied as a messenger. We see this in Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1. Behold... I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, the Lord whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That's an important phrase. Now, in a minute I'll tell you. Whom delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Throughout the Old Testament, the messenger of the covenant has always been recognized as the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is the only one that can fulfill a covenant. He is the only one that can keep the covenant. And so when we see even the messenger of the covenant, it is known as to be Christ. In verse 1 of our text, has all the insignias of deity. So when we look at Revelation 10.1, it says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. In Psalm 97, tells us that clouds are all around the Lord. They're all around him here as well. He, he went in a cloud. He comes in a cloud. He's going to return in a cloud. And the clouds are his chariots, the scriptures tell us, over and over again. The text goes on to say the rainbow was upon his head, a symbol of covenant faithfulness. Do you remember the, the rainbow? The rainbow was a promise that the world would never be flooded again with a worldwide flood wiping out all but eight souls. And so when we see that bow in the air, we see it as a faithful covenant keeping God. And once again, we see that upon his head. And his face was, was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, which remind us of his tremendous strength. If you remember, there's only one worthy to open up the scroll. There's only one that can open up the scroll. There is no one else. They wept in heaven because there was not anyone that could open up the scroll. Well, in that scroll is a book. And so this must be, without a doubt, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he will be, come as an angel at this point. So, therefore, the scriptures therefore conclude this mighty angel is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this so important? Why should we take a break between the sixth and seventh trumpet? Well, for several reasons. Uh, th this text is an interlude to get refocused on the one who is always victorious. Christ is always victorious. And those of us that are in Christ, we are also victorious. We are victorious in death. Did you know when you take your last breath one day and you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are in Him, and as He rose, you will too. When you lay off mortality for immortality, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 that we will be with Him. That is encouraging for us. This is very encouraging. Our Savior is alive. Our Savior is seated on the right hand of God. He's interceding for us. Hey, are you going through a tough time right now? Your great high priest has already been there for you. And the only comfort you can real find is, is find him. And, and rely on him because he is our great high priest. He is the one who in the quietness of night, when the tears are flowing, he can help us through whatever we are going through. This is very encouraging. Our Savior is seated on the right hand. He's interceding. He is carrying out the decrees promised by the Father because worthy is the Lamb who was slain for sinners. What a glorious hope. He can meet your every need as a suffering one who is now exalted and redeemed, or exalted and we can be redeemed, and he can keep us through the most difficulties of time. You know, if you're a person who flies, anybody here fly often? Has anybody, has anybody not flown in an airplane? Anybody here not flown? Okay, so you all have. Do you know, like, I love takeoffs. That's, to me... Uh, my wife does not like the takeoff and the landings. I love the takeoff. I love the roar of the engine. I get fired up when I feel the thrust and I feel us going forward and, 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 and we're going and the plane begins to shake a little bit and, 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 and all of a sudden it leaves the ground and, and, and you feel it breaking the law of gravity. And, and, and all of a sudden, it, it thrust up. And the other day I uh, traveled, last time I traveled was when that bad storm was at, um, at O'Hare all the way to the airport. I said to my wife, I'm not happy about flying. I'm not happy about going. The, they kept saying the storms were bad. They kept saying, and then the pilot, I, I'm thinking, maybe he's a cowboy in his attitude. I can make it. I'm thinking, you know, are you sure? And he says, he says we're going to go. And I said, oh. He says, it's going to be choppy for the first half hour. But anyways, 
We, 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 we flew up through those clouds, and it was lightning and thundering, and we were shaking. But all of a sudden, we popped up out of those clouds and were far above the clouds. We got to a place where it was absolutely gorgeous. I told my wife after I landed that I was looking down from that clarity and saw the storm in the clouds. I saw the storm in a whole different vantage point. Going through it was not good. Looking down at it was good. So if you fly, this is the picture here. John is lifted up above the clouds from the persecution and the circumstances of this world to gaze upon Jesus. That's being in the throne room. Listen, I don't know what you're going through, but I know you are. You've got to get to the throne room because Jesus stands across the whole earth. He is in charge of all things. He knows what is best. And so we need to get in that airplane and get above the clouds and look down and see the beauty and the awesomeness of our God. In this vision, his face is shining as the sun and his clouds are at his feet. I thought about that verse because everything was under me. And I said, wow, I have a little bit of, of calmness before we have to go back down through those clouds maybe to land. Is that not like life? But that's our God. That's what grace does when we see the holiness of God in his word. It lifts us up for a moment to see where we will be one day. I want to tell you a story. You don't know this man. His name is Charles B. Holmesher. Charles B. Holmesher is the founder of Neighborhood Bible Time. And he had a very large impact upon my life. Just like you can probably think of people that have an impact in your life, for good or bad. But for Charles B. Holmesher, the impact upon my life was all good. I don't see anything negative in the impact that he had on me. And we were in Paxton, Illinois, and all 40 of the men were outside waiting for our big dinner. And then the next day, we were launching out all over the United States to do what MBT does. And so we were all on the side there, and Brother Holmesher was living at the time, so it was pre-2013, must have been maybe around 2010, I guess. And so we're all standing out there, and we're singing. And I want to tell you, it was beautiful. The men were crying. The men were joyous. They were so excited. And, and the music was unbelievable. And I, I, I looked over at Brother Holmesher. He was kind of standing against the building a little bit. And I realized that he was not there. He was having a rapture moment. I believe he was <laughs> above all the clouds, so to say, because he could not... If I would have said, uh, we call them boss, if I would have said boss, he probably would have not even heard me. I believe at that moment, and God can do that when we concentrate and meditate on his scriptures and see his holiness, even in the most difficult situations, he can tell us, yes, you're going through this, but it'll be okay. And that's what God wants to do. That's why this verse is important to us. That's why John is telling us this. We're not going to be there. We're going to already be in heaven. So what good is this? This is the good, because we're not in heaven yet. Are any of you going through anything at all? Or is there everything just really just easy going? It's like strawberries and apple pie every day. No. And so we can look at these scriptures and we can see him. But right now we live, we're living below our privileges. We're living in this world. God says, no, I'm going to keep you here a little longer. I want to fly away. No. I'm not done with you. I, I'm going to use you in a mighty way to accomplish my will. Stay the course. Don't quit. See, you are a son and daughter of the Most High, but not everything is fulfilled yet. So chapter 10 reminds us of the promise we have. So keep on pressing on. Don't quit. Your redemption is nigh. Catch the throne room daily. Go to this chapter and read how high and mighty he is. And when you don't understand, trust him. See, the rainbow in our text is not only a promise to us that God will never destroy mankind by water. It also reminds us, as when we see a rainbow, reminds us that the storm has passed. 
There's something about after a fresh storm, seeing the rainbow, you might not right away think about Noah, but you say, oh, the storm is over. The storm has passed, and you see this beautiful color in, in the sky, and maybe even, maybe even a double rainbow. It reminds us that the storm has passed. It's been exhausted, and the sun is shining on his people. John is letting us know, for the believers, the storm is past. Jesus lived below the clouds. Jesus suffered and died below the clouds. Jesus is our passionate Savior. He's been where we have been, and he understands and feels all the pain that we have. And now he is exalted. The grave has released him at his voice. He has passed through the clouds of our sin. He is seated at the right hand of God. This is our Savior, described with a rainbow on his head. This cannot be just any ordinary angel. The suffering is past. The storm of evil has been broken. He is Lord and King. So when he roars, it's victory. It's past. Praise God, the storm is past. Your sins are forgiven. It's summed up in the hymn written by Charles Wesley. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is me. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Wow, that's us. We're victorious. Yes, it's going to be hard. It is going to be difficult. You're going to scratch your head. You're going to say, I'd say pull your hair out, but um, you know, you're going to get to that point where you're going to say, why, why, why? And God's going to say, vindication's coming, and when you get to heaven, you're going to find out that I loved you so much that it was perfect what I did. Perfect what I did. I'm so glad that it is, aren't you? What big storms you are going through right now. You're going through storms. I know you are. Are heavy clouds hanging over you? Sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? John describes to us that our Savior has already been there for you. He has gone through all things you are facing. Our great high priest has gone through the clouds of your life. Every second of your life, he's already seen. He's bigger than life. He's bigger than your life. He has gone through the clouds of your own sin and guilt to pay it on your behalf. That's how much he loved you. Many before us have suffered what we are going through and even greater. They trusted God's hand and you must as well. That's the answer. Don't look for it anywhere else. There is the answer. The answer is God knows. God makes no mistakes. God will be glorified through your pain one day, somehow, somewhere, maybe to somebody else. Who knows? You may never find out until you get to heaven, but you will find it out. And Revelation chapter 10 verse 5 says, And the angel which I saw standing upon the scene upon the earth lifted up his hands to heaven. This is symbolic. This is, this is not literally standing there, but, but, but in the sense of the text says that his right foot is, is upon the sea and his left foot is on the earth. The symbolism of bigness of our Savior. He covers everything. A to Z. A to Z. I love those little uh, warranties they always try to get you in the store. You know, you buy a, a product, you just, you know, s- spend a mortgage to get it. And then they say, well, do you want to insure? And I say, well, no, you just told me it was the best product. Why, you know, it'll never break. Why would I want to insure it? And then they try to get you insured. Why? Because it's breakable. But the promises we have in Christ are yea and nay. When has God ever let you down? When has God ever not fulfilled a promise that he has given you? Jesus is able in the midst of all that is happening in the world, the famines, the destructions, and man's inhumanity to man, all the demonic activity, yet in the midst of all these things, Jesus, the lamb lion, stands over them. He towers over them. He straddles the globe like a giant colossus. 
He's like Atlas. You remember those? When you were a little kid, you know, you have little pencil arms. And they, they, they send you these magazines, right? In Sports Illustrated. And there's, you know, do this and do that. And there's Atlas holding the whole world. Well, Jesus has you in his hands. He's, you're, he's, he's right there holding you. And you must understand that God would never purposely hurt or harm his children. He doesn't do it. When he allows you to go through these, it is for your own good and for his glory always. Always. Even when we can't see the answer. That's what makes it so hard. Because we always want the answer, don't we? Why am I, do, why, why am I going through this, Lord? You know, why, why is my back hurt? Uh, why don't my eyes see? Uh, you know, why did I lose a spouse? Why, 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 why is all this? One foot on the land and one foot on the sea. What a picture of the sovereignty of God over evil and the protection of his people. Remember, all authority has been given unto Jesus in heaven and earth. Stay the course. He's in control. All will be vindicated one day. One day, that's what Revelation reminds us of and all future events. And God's in control. God knows what he's doing and we can trust him. John's vision is a picture that everything is the Lord's. He owns it all. Satan owns nothing. Boy, he sure acts like it, doesn't he? He acts like he owns your life, your mind, your control. It's like you don't have any say in this at all. Satan owns nothing. His days are numbered. My dad used to say that. He used to say, watch it. Your days are numbered. When he'd get upset. Good thing he didn't carry those threats out. But he'd say, your days are numbered. Every day as we glance at the news, we understand America is going in the wrong direction. It is insanity let out of the pit of hell. With so many churches going the wrong, wrong direction, so many um, sins that are just unbelievable that we are seeing is accepted today as normal. The natural depravity of the human heart is less restrained. So the message here to us is simply found in Psalms 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. One day, I don't know how many of you have a footstool or an ottoman, whatever you call it. I use it all the time. You know what goes on it? My feet. To rest. And God says, wait a minute, all those enemies, all that evil that you think seems to be out of control, they're right there, and one day they will be crushed. And all wrongs will be made right. But I am so long-suffering, and I love your children that are unconverted, and your grandparents that are unconverted, and your friends that are unconverted, and your workmates that are unconverted. I am so long-suffering that I am going to wait a little bit longer. Aren't you glad? I'm glad he's waiting. Revelation 10.6 says this. Another reason that it can't be an angel, I swear by him all the time that we see in the scriptures that God's, God does an oath. We, we do an oath. You know that, right? You put your hand on the Bible. You say, I promise I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. We, we swear by something greater than us. Well, who does God swear to? He can't swear by anybody greater. So the Bible tells us that he swears to himself because he is. And when he says something, it is true. And I swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein. That's him. And the earth and the things that are therein and the sea and the things that are therein. That there should be time no longer. Now this is an important phrase. That there should be time no longer. The phrase that there should be time no more. This is saying that there will be no more delays now that there's an interlude. When it's over... It comes quickly. So all the control and everything that is taking place in the Greek language there, it's saying, listen, I'm giving you a breath. Catch a breath. Catch a breath because once, you, once we reactivate this, there's no stopping. We are at the 1,260th day. We're going to have the abomination of desolation. And there is going to be an upheaval that is unbelievable, and there will be no more interludes. That's where I want to relate it to where we are today, because we're not going to be there, because if we're born again, we're already going to be in heaven. Church, this is an interlude. 
between the 69th week and the 70th week. We don't know how long it's going to be. We need to take advantage of every opportunity we have to grow in grace and know our Savior and to let him use us for his will and his mission. This is a small interlude. Think about this, Mr. Tim. You're only going to have Luke for a small interlude at this age he is right now. You better take advantage of every moment of it. Tori, you got those beautiful girls. And they are growing up tremendously fast. You only have your children for so long. Craig, you're an empty nester. And it happens that quick. And so you want to take advantage of this interlude right now the church age is golden it is beautiful the power of god the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church we have all power to accomplish what he wants us to do let's not hold back why are we holding back we're gonna get to heaven and god's gonna say why'd you hold back well there was giants in the land no i defeated the giants i couldn't do it it was too hard no, I wanted to give you the grace to do it. There's nothing that you can't accomplish in me. And so that's what we're talking about here. The, the time is quick. Revelation 10, 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, so when that trumpet does sound, the mystery of God should be finished, and he hath declared to his servants the prophets. In other words, it's slippery slide. It's going to go very quickly and then the last point is the apostle in the book the apostle in the book now we look at the last four verses and it deals with the eating of the book and the symbolism to us will help us to understand the spiritual the spiritual meaning here and what it means practically for you and i each day so we need to know what this book represents and to understand it understand what it means to eat the book you realize it's figurative. Don't go home and eat a book today because you would, you would miss everything that is said here. In the, Greek, in, in the Greek, the word book or scroll is diminutive. It means that it's little. And it's mentioned twice that it's little. And so it could be said that it's a little, little book. It's an abridged book of the bigger book. So in other words, we have this scroll, the big book that we learned in chapters 4 and 5, and then there's a little book that comes out of the big book. And that's what we want to concentrate on today, what is in that little book. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, God has kept some things secret. We're just not going to know them. He just doesn't reveal them to us. Quit trying to figure it out. You really think you can figure out the mind of God? Are you that arrogant and prideful to really believe that you can figure it out? You can't. There are secret things. He's not going to let you know. So this book that John is instructed to take and then go and preach is not the book of God's hidden decrees. The little book is the gospel that is revealed unto us. This little book has the gospel in it, and that is revealed, and we know what the gospel is, and that is what we're to do. The things that are sufficient to our salvation and godly living need to be proclaimed. Just as though there's an interlude before all things and the last moments before the Antichrist is allowed to complete his conquest and force the whole world into uh, control, there's an interlude right now between 69 and 70, week of the church age to accomplish the mission of making and maturing disciples. Don't spend your time trying to figure out when the Lord is coming in the clouds. He's not going to let you know. You can figure it out all you want to. You can read all the tea leaves. You can read all the conspiracy theories on the internet. You can go and all that stuff right there. Right now, God says, John has a little book, and in that little book is the need of the gospel. How do we know it's the gospel? Well, uh, the word mystery here and the way it's used in the New Testament is much different than the way we use it today. How many of you like mystery books? 
Is there anybody here that's a mystery fan? Yeah, my wife reads a lot of mystery books. Uh, Who done it? Try to figure that out. Today we think it as a mystery book that we might read. Now Paul uses this word, this word mystery, 17 times in his epistles. So what does it mean? Well, in all 17 times, he means it in the way of the mystery of the ages, how God could be merciful to a hell-worthy, bound sinner. The gospel. The mystery in the Old Testament, they didn't understand what the mystery was, but the mystery was wrapped up in a person called Jesus Christ. So it's no longer a mystery to us. We know what the gospel is. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we need to take that and get that out to everyone. That's what he's telling John. The mystery the angel wants to look into, the mystery is now open. What was the mystery in the Old Testament is fully understood in the person of Jesus Christ, and that is the gospel. The gospel is an open secret where the great mystery of life is solved. People are always wondering, what's this all about? What's the world all about? What, do I just live, eat, drink, and then die, and they throw me in a hole, and that's it? I die like a dog? And we say, no, 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 no. Here's the mystery of life. It is now revealed, and the revelation of that is that Jesus Christ died in your place so that you could have a relationship with your creator and spend all eternity with him because your sins are forgiven. That is what he's saying you need to do, John. That's what we need to do. John doesn't live in the time of tribulation. So that book is relevant to us today. We need to get the gospel out. We're in this small little interlude of time. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Six statements are made, and they all center on Jesus Christ. The gospel is Christ. The mystery is no longer a mystery, unless we keep it a mystery. How would you feel... If you came home from the doctor tomorrow and found out you had a very rare disease and you got to your deathbed and your neighbor had the answer to your disease and he never shared it with you. That's the way we are sometimes. We work with people, we're around people and we keep what should not be a mystery, a mystery by not sharing the gospel. How many people do you work with? They don't even know you're a Christian. They have no clue. You never say, come and see. You never give them a gospel track. You never tell them the doom that they are going to have if they don't find Christ, if they don't, are not born again. So what do we do with this book? Well, John was told to eat it. And the voice which I heard from heaven in verse 8 spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and the earth. And I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. What does it mean to us? Well, it's not enough to have the Bible. It's not enough to just know the Bible intellectually. Who cares if you know every word it says in it? We must digest it. We must eat these words. When we eat something, it becomes part of us. <laughs> Whatever you're going to have for lunch today, you know, like they say, a moment at the lips of a lifetime at the hips. We know that when we consume something, it stays around with us for long periods of time. It must become a part of our very fiber. We must do what Jeremiah did in Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them. Jeremiah literally, it's saying that we need to digest God's word. And the word was with me in the joy and rejoicing in my heart. And I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. That is what is called experiential Christianity, is when we take the word of God and 
spiritually speaking, emotionally, with our mind, uh, with our soul, we drink it in. It's a spiritual eating. Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. It must be everything to us. You must become gospel center. You must be so filled with his message that his message masters you. You must live it, love it, carry it, memorize it, meditate upon it, breathe it, talk it, walk it, give it, teach it, preach it. You must be a sermon in shoes. It must master you. It must overtake you. You and the gospel must become inseparable. You must be an open epistle of my grace everywhere you go. That's what the mighty angel says. It has one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. I am supreme. I am the purpose of everything in life and everyone needs to hear it. And I have created the church and I have died for the church and I am the church so that you can get the message out. There's no excuse. You must live it, give it, preach it, teach it, eat it, meditate on it. It must become you. So church, this is the only way we get the gospel out into our community. All the evil of hell works diligently to keep you from this book of knowledge. John is telling us that this is what we need to change a person. You can't change your spouse. Did you realize that yet? Those of you who have been married longer than two minutes? You can't change your spouse. Your spouse can't change you. But God can. God can. John is telling this is what we need to reveal the power of a changed life, to change a community. And in Revelation 10, 11, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. He's talking to John that I want you to take this little book and before kings and people, I want you to give them what's in this little book because it is not a secret. It is not a mystery. It is out there. We have it. We, you can't fully understand the gospel unless you're born again. But then he says an interesting thing as we close. He takes it and he eats it up and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So we have a contrast here. God uses contrast quite often in the scriptures. It's not all sweet. There are times it's bitter. There are times as a born-again believer, it feels a little bitter. When we see people dying without the gospel, we're bothered by that. It's bitter in our belly. When we are taken advantage of, sometimes we're taken advantage of. When we see our brothers and sisters take a stand for the gospel and they lose their job or they lose their life or they're put in prison or they're persecuted for the faith, it's difficult. There's a bitterness in our spirit when we do not carry out the mission of making and maturing disciples. When you, if you're born again in here and you're doing nothing for God, there's a bitterness in your belly. There has to be because you are not getting the joy that God wants to give you. But then there's the sweetness. The sweetness is when we want everyone to have what is in that book and then to see it and to hear it. When you share the gospel, there's a sweetness that comes out for all to see a truly a spirit of humility. Jesus says we're in the last days. Time is short. Get busy because the 70th week begins as soon as Christ returns in the clouds. So there is this time period here. And so chapter 10, I hope, is a hope to you because we all are facing difficult times of circumstances. Look into the throne room. Go to the throne room. Access the throne room. You can by grace. When you do, God gives you the grace you need, not to fully understand everything that happened, but enough to keep on. He gives you enough grace to get up every day and face the next day. And one day, you'll find, through vindication, that God was right and he was perfect. And then the bitterness might be, for us as believers, is not only what we see happen to other Christians, we're just not living the Christ life. I mean, yeah, we tap at it. We show up every once in a while. But we're really not all in. We're only in where we want to be in. And God says, I want you to be all in. I bought you with a price. You can't be half in. You can't be half in. Half in is always lukewarm. He wants all of you.
So here's the challenge as we end. If you're here today and you're not born again, then you need to be saved. That's the whole purpose of 10. The little book says that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that you can put your faith and trust in him and he will forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life through his righteousness. Not of anything you do, but what he does. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For us that are in here are believers, what will you do with the message? What will you do with Christ today? Listen, don't walk around in a fog. Get above the clouds. Let God show you what he wants to show you so you can keep moving forward. And those of you right here that refuse to get above the clouds, you need to, or you're just going to be a frustrated Christian. Frustrated all the time. Just, just always frustrated. And that's the bitterness that sometimes when we can have the sweetness. We want the sweetness. Mr. Uh, Paul will come and he'll play on the piano. This is your time of decision. Um, I don't say me because guess what? I've been studying it all week. I've been in the chastisement of the Lord. I've already gotten some things right. I have an advantage that you don't have right now. Not that there's not more. I'm just saying that I've been thinking on this. I'm meditating on it. You're hearing it for the first time, but what is the Holy Spirit telling you? Whatever it is, maybe you're saying here, I'm just overwhelmed with life right now. Then get in the throne room. Or maybe you say, you know what? I am just a pew sitter. I really don't use my talents. I don't use my gifts. I don't share my faith. Then let's make those changes. And you're here today and you say, you know what? I'm just not saved. I'm not born again. I don't know Jesus. I need to be saved today. You come. Let me or my wife or somebody take the scriptures and show you how you can know for sure where you'll spend eternity. As Mr. Paul plays uh, a hymn there, you make the decision you need to make. Are you unsaved? Humble yourself and come forward. Come and grab my hand and let us take the scriptures and show you how you can know for sure. What decision will you make today? Come on, you need to be saved. You come, you come, come. Don't leave here unconverted. I sense that need is here. Father, thank you today for the message. It's your word. Uh, John, in his ability to listen and you using him, and he writes down what is relevant to us today. Thank you that you are God. Thank you for that. Comfort us. We need comfort every day. Now, Father, we also pray that whatever decision needs to be made would be made, and if there would be anybody here unconverted, that they would come and catch me before they leave. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Now we're going to double dip here a little bit. And you say, what does that mean? It means I'm going to ask you to stay a little bit longer. Uh, over on the side here to my right, to your left, is the communion uh, cups. If you would like to take one, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may participate, and they're over here to my right. If you want to just grab one, um, that'll be fine. And uh, thank you. Uh, Tim, would you mind grabbing me one? I forgot to bring one up here with me.
does not take one. He doesn't take one. We started getting these because of the safety of COVID. So you'll have to, you know, unseal it and open it up to um, not to get to the bread. There's a little piece of bread in there too, but um, I, I, I put a, a piece of bread in there, a cracker in there, but you'll have to open it up to get to the juice, of course. So, all righty. Well, what's going to happen here is I'm going to explain here uh, 1 Corinthians 11, read a couple verses, and then Mr. Paul is going to play through a hymn, a few stanza of it, where it give you time to just uh, review your own life, to just kind of think through things, because the Bible says that we should not take the Lord's table unworthily. In other words, we ought to clear our conscience of anything that the Holy Spirit is telling us that um, would be unconfessed sin. Don't sit there and look for something. You know what that is. If there's been like something the Lord's been reminding you for weeks, hey, you're bitter against this person, you're angry against this person, the Bible says it's better for you not to take the Lord's table than to take it with not confessing that sin. He says that's why some of you sleep, are asleep among us, because you have taken the cup unworthily. So the scriptures say, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 11, verse number 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now before we take that, Paul's going to play, and then when he's done, we'll take the bread together. So this time together, we will take the bread, remembering his broken body for us. And then after the same manner, also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new covenant, is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as he plays, let's take time to remember the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary, and then we will drink the cup when he's finished.
And then, of course, as he said, uh, that we to do this as oft as remember him, and we are today. So go ahead now. We can take this symbolism here. And there's little trash cans around and in the back. Um, as we close and leave, remember, sign up if you're interested in church membership. We'd love to get in contact with you. You're not joining by coming to that meeting. It just is answering questions that you might have. We'll provide the pizza. You just need to bring a little side dish and we'll have a little bit of a fellowship. Please, also in this message today, I'm not looking for an outward commitment to show spirituality. Don't do it because that's what I think I should do. We ought to serve the Lord out of a grateful heart for what he has done. Remember, you cannot find any more favor with God than you already have being born again. It's just your usability. God wants to use you now. So don't get those things crossed up there. We don't work. Uh, we, we work or we, we serve because we're so grateful because he's given us so much. You, you don't get any more favor by God because you come here twice a week. You don't get any more favor with God because you work. We do it because we want to. We want to serve. We want to use our talents. That's what it must be. Don't get caught in that evil, evil trap of works. Don't do that. Father, thank you for Christ. Give us a good time of fellowship now. That's part of our worship. May we enjoy and may the, the sounds rise high of us laughing and enjoying one another. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, thank you, Ryan, so much for helping us today. Appreciate it.